Let's play a new game, shall we? Who's the dumbest politician in Australia today? Spoiler alert, all of them, obviously. Details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. This video is proudly sponsored by Olight. More on that later, but for now, let us shine a light of a completely different kind on high quality political dipshittery export grade. You can doubtless smell it from way over there. Today's contender from the Parliament of New South Shitsville itself, Minister for Planning and Public Spaces, former Minister for Rooty Hill by the Sea, correction, I mean the Central Coast, and hey, it's, it's just a joke, bogans. Rob Stokes. Rob is, of course, one of my favourite animals, a lawyer who blossomed one day into a politician like the ugly duckling that woke up one day a bush pig. Just what society needs. <coughs> they can agree. More lawyers in Parliament. Yes. Of course, I am merely making a piece of general social commentary about all lawyers who transition into the sphere of political ugliness. And no comment whatsoever is made about Mr Stokes' aesthetic qualities whatsoever. Like... Seems like a very attractive man to me, like, I'm not gay, but just saying. Mr Stokes' recent overarching hypothesis on vehicles would be quite entertaining if it weren't also apparently an honestly held set of thought bubbles. His opinions on this were reported recently in a puff piece by Costello's Cockheads. And by that, I mean smh.com.au, which, as you know, is a division of Coalition Suckfest Incorporated, which some folks still call Nine Entertainment. <coughs> Assholes. Anyway, Mr Stokes claims cars are bad because they, quote, enslave us. And he adds that transitioning to EVs is just a kind of green band-aid at best. So, cars bad, 12th century good, apparently. I'm paraphrasing. They, he means EVs, still perpetuate physical inactivity and propagate sedentary lifestyles. To which I would retort... <laughs> Listen, dude, we're not all state government ministers with a cushy office close to home on the northern frickin' beaches. Cars are essential for many Australians to live their friggin' lives. That's not negotiable, dude. I'd like to know how many times Stokesy has actually commuted to Parliament House from the beaches on a bicycle and or public transport or, I don't know, swum. That would be beyond excellent to know, really, you know, just for perspective, because if he routinely arrives there by car and returns, then that seems kind of hypocritical to me. Not a case of leading by example. The Stokemeister says we need to transition away from private cars rather than focus on how those cars are powered. And by we, I presume, like most politicians, he means, of course, everyone else except him and his fellow privileged asshole members of parliament. In other words, Mr Stokes' core message is the most virtuous car you could possibly own is no car at all. How fucking out of touch. And yet also, how fucking zen. Changing from a polluting master, he means internal combustion, to a more efficient master, he means EVs, does not alter our growing dependence on, some might say, enslavement to private motor vehicles. So let me contextualise that enslavement for you, Mr Stokes. In the context of recorded human history, the shittest car you can own today, in the shittest traffic jam this week, actually gives you more mobility than a Roman emperor 
or an Egyptian friggin' pharaoh. So there's that. Cars and roads are simply a shit way to get everyone into the CBD together at 9am and then home again at 5. The system gets overwhelmed and operates with frustrating inefficiency if that's how you roll with it. And as planning minister, like he'd be responsible for viable mass transit alternatives to mitigate this problem. And on this, Sydney is truly a shit sandwich. And I suspect I do speak for many in the electorate when I say I would prefer Mr Stokes to focus on the de-shittification of public transport rather than crying into his tie-dyed frickin' dreadlocks about this alleged vehicular enslavement we all suffer, which is actually one of the greatest liberations of recorded human history. Because EVs are so heavy, those particulates from brakes and tyres can actually be more significant than from existing petrol and diesel powered vehicles. Honestly, like sometimes I do despair at who we elect to call the shots in society. I surely do. Stokesy there again, tripping over his vegetables metaphorically in public, personal opinion. I mean, ignorance is probably bliss, but Dude, not for the people you represent in the electorate. Just not. We might deconstruct that Himalaya of horse shit in just a sec so you can decide for yourself just how ill-informed Mr Stokes is on this. But now, a message from our sponsor. Olight makes some of the best and brightest torches a man can own, or a woman, or whatever other options there are for the kids these days. I find it very difficult to keep up, frankly. There's a sale on details in a sec, like up to 35% off, free torches thrown in, that kind of thing. Link in the description. You can skip ahead if you're not interested in this stuff, obviously. I was crushed the other day because I could not find my fine Warrior X Pro. I had an inconvenient infestation of zombies to slay and my prized tool was nowhere to be found. Then I remembered. I had jammed it in the freezer a month ago, of course. But it didn't freeze in time for that Olight video. Dude, check that out. It's still got the ice in the handle there and it's I'm getting frostbite hanging on to it. A month on ice. This thing is colder than a politician's heart and it's still completely functional, pumping out those fat photons after that length of time. Big discounts from 8pm tonight on the mighty Olight Javelot Turbo and Marauder 2 Olights. Love these names. They're both lightsabers practically. That Javelot, like 1300 lumens and a really tight beam with a throw of 1300 meters. A superb long distance torch for the 4x4 or the boat with excellent battery life. Great for search and rescue. It's got good heft too in case you need to beat a zombie to death in close quarters one day and nicely crenellated bezel to collect zombie DNA for countermeasures development back at the lab too and a scope mountable option for hunting the undead at a distance. So a bit of an all round there. Olight does great packaging and clever recharging too with the included magnetic USB cable. You just keep that in the car and plug it into any USB port and you'll be good to go. Flash sale tonight from 8 p.m. That's Thursday the 27th of May until midnight tomorrow, which would be Friday, obviously. Subject to the world not ending tonight, you know. Link to the flash sale in the description, plus you'll get 10% off outside the sale using the code AEJC10. Thank you to Olight for making politician upending packages such as these possible. Back to Mr Stokes now and this allegation that particles from brakes and tyres are bad for human health. 
This is certainly true, and as exhausts themselves get cleaner, except for those old trucks infesting our Australian cities, which is exactly the kind of thing a planning minister should actually give a shit about, but will not address because the trucking lobby is so freaking powerful. But as exhausts get cleaner generally, particles from brakes and tyres are going to make up a proportionally larger part of the particle pollution problem. Sorry to break it to you, Stokesy, but EVs and hybrids actually have this thing called regenerative braking, dude, which is a rock-solid system that is also a means of capturing a car's kinetic energy and pumping it back into the battery while slowing the car down without generating any brake dust. Generating fat electrons instead in lieu of brake dust. Regenerative braking is quite effective which means that EVs and hybrids are far less reliant on their conventional braking systems than ordinary cars, which means that their brake dust emissions are substantially lower. A differential proof on this, conventional brakes on EVs and hybrids hardly ever wear out and they don't need to be serviced all that often. I don't know about you, but Stokesy does not get a free pass on his apparent ignorance of this, at least not from me. Apparently, he also has a master's in science from Oxford. I don't know if it's proper science or the science of frickin' basket weaving, but he should understand this, in my view, before commenting upon it. I don't know if the lobotomy for cabinet ministers is still part of the swearing-in ceremony. I suspect it may be. On this allegation that EVs are, quote, so heavy, let us test Stokesy's quaint hypothesis and put it in context, okay? And I'll try and be as fair as possible on this. I will steel man his argument rather than straw man it, okay? A Hyundai Kona 1.6 Turbo Highlander, the combustion one, has a curb weight of 1,507 kilos, right? Kona Electric Highlander, which is the same thing with an electric powertrain, 1,743 kilos. That is 16% heavier, okay? And I'm using this example because, A, this is a mainstream EV, some would say affordable, and not some Tesla Model S supercar saloon, and B, it's one of the few such vehicles with internal combustion only and battery EV powertrain options. So it is a direct comparison, one of the few available in the market. Energy is proportional to mass generally, and you would expect 16% greater tyre wear if the vehicles were driven the same, except EVs run low rolling resistance tyres, so there's that, and also the regenerative brake thing for the brake dust, right? But in terms of the vehicles we sons and daughters of convicts actually buy, based on national vehicle sales data for Australia last month, which would be April of 2021, our most popular vehicle was the Ford Ranger. And the Ranger Wildtrak is 2,278 kilos, which is 31% heavier than a Kona Electric. It's the most popular vehicle in Australia today. The third in sales was the Toyota Hilux, which is the same shit, different day, on outright heft. Number five and number ten were the Triton and D-Max, respectively. So, same deal there on automotive obesity relative to the Kona EV. Land Cruiser came in at number four. Run out frenzy. Yes. And of course, a Land Cruiser Sahara tips the scales at a morbidly obese, 2,740 kilos, which is just three kilos shy of one metric tonne heavier than a Kona Electric. Second place was RAV4, a non-hybrid RAV4 cruiser, is lighter than a Kona Electric, but only by 123 kilos, which is roughly one fat person worth of differential. And CX-5 was in sixth. And it too is lighter than a Kona Electric, but only by 25 kilos, which is kind of inconsequential. That's for an Akira 2.5 turbo. So not all that much less tire dust being generated there, I'd suggest. 
Toyota Corolla in seventh spot, Mitsubishi ASX in eighth, and Hyundai i30 in ninth are the vehicles that round out the top ten, and they're all about 300 kilos lighter than a Kona electric ballpark. So, compared with the vehicles actual Australians in the electorate are buying today, a Kona electric is substantially lighter than five of the most popular vehicles today, and similar in curb weight to two of them, and only significantly heavier than three of the most popular vehicles. On balance, that's pretty much the so heavy Stokesy hypothesis busted, I'd suggest. It's just inconvenient political bullshit rhetoric served up to the mainstream media, which functions as a de facto PR department for those assholes. It's essentially bullshit when you look at the sales volumes for the heavyweights, right? Ranger, Hilux, Triton, D-Max and Land Cruiser versus all EVs and you just crunch any numbers on the tyre dust, right? Like, come on. An allegedly smart dude like Stokesy, with all of those degrees, right? He should be able to look at the tonne kilometres based on the mass differentials and the sales volumes and the fact that there's no regenerative braking on those five super popular heavyweights. And the only conclusion that is drawable defensively is that vehicles like these are the actual culprits in terms of brake and tyre emissions and wear and tear on our roads. And hey, I own a Triton 4x4 dual cab and a Santa Fe diesel 4x4. I mean, I am enslaved by them, obviously. So I am part of this alleged problem. Hey, put the cuffs on any time you want when that becomes criminal. And, but an unkind person might suggest that asshole politicians in New South Shitsville are just looking to do a Vicwegia and implement a road user tax on EVs, the better to further cement our national status as a global friggin' laughingstock on environmental issues. Pro tip on EVs and user pays taxes, right? Why are roads a critical piece of economic infrastructure, roads, why are they a user pays proposition at all? Like, law and order is not like that. The health system is not like that. And defence is not like that. Frequent users of the police or hospitals don't get taxed more heavily. Darwinians, more susceptible to invasion up there, obviously, more in need of the army, therefore. They don't pay extra tax, user pays for the defence of the realm, do they? Like, so why roads? Especially as governments can't seem to build roads without these utterly corrupt public-private partnerships, unquote, resulting in tolls being paid by we users anyway, on top of the taxes we already pay. So, an EV owner on a toll road is going to pay the toll, and then those Ks will add to his or her user pays tally at the end of each period, and he'll thus pay tax twice. Quasi-tax once, and then tax after that. That's not like a totally discriminatory double whammy or anything. It's just like paying GST on your fuel excise for the combustion powered, now that I think about it. Anyway, this whole governmental suggestion that EV owners are avoiding fuel excise is like claiming that non-smokers are avoiding the tax on ciggies or the sober are avoiding the tax on booze which is kind of like claiming atheism is a religion or declaring that my sport of choice is not playing golf. Meanwhile, back in reality, EVs are 50% more expensive than equivalent internal combustion vehicles, ballpark. And therefore, the people buying EVs are generally more affluent than conventional new car buyers who are themselves typically among society's most affluent people because not everyone out there can afford a brand new car. Therefore, EV buyers have already paid substantially more income tax, getting to the point where they can afford their brand new EV. And then when they buy it, they pay proportionally more GST and stamp duty, like 
thousands of extra dollars there, and possibly also the entirely bullshit luxury car tax, which was implemented, let's not forget, to protect allegedly the local car manufacturing industry, which failed years ago and which no longer exists. In fact, one could make a compelling argument that the only remaining viable artefact of local car manufacturing here in Schittsville is the entirely unjustifiable luxury car tax, which kind of proves definitively that politicians are tax-addicted, out-of-touch assholes, lacking even vestigial respect for the electorate or the future. As if there were really any lingering doubt about that.